You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You're watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am one of your esteemed hosts today, Jimmy Wong. And I'm your other esteemed host. It's Rachel Weeks. Two steams. We're getting ready to cook an egg in here. Paris steams. It's steamy. It is steamy because today we're talking, <laughs> we're talking about the commanders that we hate playing against. Yeah, that means it's going to be a team episode. We have a lot of members of the Command Zone that are going to pop in and let you know what commanders they hate playing against. You might agree or disagree. It's going to be a lot of fun talk regardless. But before we get into it, we got to talk quickly about our sponsors so you can buy the commander that you hate playing against the most or the answers to it at cardkingdom.com slash command. That's our affiliate link if you want to support the show, but also get the magic cards that you need right now. Go to cardkingdom.com slash command. They got a great inventory. You get all of your cards in one convenient single package and their website has a ton to explore. If you go over there, you can paste in deck lists and see the entire thing that you want to buy all at once. Choose the style, the, the quality and add it all to your cart. It's so convenient and easy. We love using cards. Card Kingdom. They also have great customer service. They have sealed products, singles, you name it. Head on over to cardkingdom.com slash command. Type that into your URL bar and you are rolling. When while you are URLing, go <laughs> you are rolling. While you are rolling, <laughs> head on over to ultrapro.com slash command. That is the place to go to pick up some of the best quality accessories in magic get your sleeves and your deck boxes uh binders play mats play mats whatever you need to make sure that your cards are safe and can travel well and look cool yeah and uh, don't get damaged that's it, the big yeah <laughs> i really like uh the satin cubes because we travel a lot with our decks we're going around to magic cons all the time now and i want to make sure that when i fly with my decks they're easy to open but they're safe in their container and i trust Indeed. ultra pro with my decks uh plus they have the officially licensed art so all of the art that you know and love from magic one of our favorite parts of the game in general you can get those on sleeves you can get them on play mats you can get them even on binders these days uh keep an eye on the ultrapro.com slash command website for all the new art coming out for wilds of eldraine yeah they just had actually and they do this occasionally if you sign up for their newsletter they just had a 20 to 50 percent flash sale off magic they do this a couple of times every year and tons of products for really cheap so it's a great way to make some savings as well uh and speaking of ultra pro we also have a play mat right now that ultra pro is printing for us yeah. on kickstarter if you head on over the link is in the show notes below this is a limited time kickstarter for a brand new play mat and it's called go to combat shing shing it's Sweet. Yeah. It's yeah. Really cool art. It comes in regular and in foil. Hollow like, foil. Ho hollow yeah, foil pro. printing. Um, they look they look really amazing. This art is exclusive to the Command Zone and to this Kickstarter. Yeah, the art's by Diana Franco Campos. It's got four knights around the table. You can see the extra turns and Game Nights logo in the back. And there's also add-ons. So if you pledge at any tier, you can add on these really cool uh, tokens, metal tokens that we have. Yeah. They're amazing. You can flip them over. They have two sides. You can use them to remind yourself of a trigger or to track things like the monarchy um, or just like, a, you know, make this, a, it's a one-one. Whatever you want, uh, they, they have a great feel to them. And of course, you've got the Jimmy Food token in there too. So who doesn't want a little bit of that <laughs> going on? But yeah, check out the Kickstarter. It's limited time only. This is gonna be one of your best chances to get this play mat. Um, and once the Kickstarter is over, you cannot pledge for it anymore. We always get people asking us every single year, every single campaign, the messages come pouring in afterwards being like, oh no, I uh, missed out on this. So don't miss out. Go to Kickstarter, lock in that pledge, and you can check out the options and maybe add some add-ons. Yeah, do it before October 15th. Yeah. Kickstarter is a great way to support the show, but of course you can always support the, support the show directly over at patreon.com slash command zone. Uh, Patreon's our patrons get a ton of cool perks, but we always shout out one lucky patron every single podcast episode. And this one is dedicated to, to Zach Tutosi. Tutosi, Tutosi. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, thanks, Zach. You, you rock. rock. Okay, here's the topic, Commanders. We hate playing against and hate here, you know, we hate to love and we love to hate. So it's not like we're going to rip the card up across the table, but we all definitely don't have our favorites. 
Yeah, and it's a personal preference, right? Like, yeah. there's everybody has different decks that they love to play, and it's also different decks that they don't love playing against for whatever reason. You're yeah. like, it doesn't match my play style, or, oh, my friend has this one deck, and it is so aggravating. <laughs> yeah, it's so aggro, or it's so control. Yeah. It's going to be different for every player, so hopefully you can find something in this episode that resonates with you, either as the player playing the deck, or the player playing against it. Yeah, we talked to all of the members of the, well, many of the members at the Command Zone, team here to get their opinion on commanders that they don't enjoy playing against so (laughs) we'll have the whole gamut and we're gonna turn it over to them all right let's hear what they got to say up first we've got writer jamie block hey everybody fun to be back yep writer here and producer on the live show so if you like those things i'm glad he did it i did some stuff So we're talking about commanders that we don't like playing against for whatever reason. They're too powerful. They take too long. uh, But you have some very special reasoning behind this next one. So which one did you pick? Yeah, I have a lot of little reasons to hate playing against Light Paws Emperor's Voice. Now, uh, Light Paws is a two mana two two. It's one in a white for a legendary creature, Fox Advisor. And it reads, whenever an aura enters the battlefield under your control, if you cast it, you may search your library for an aura card with mana value less than or equal to that aura and with a different name than each aura you control. Put that card onto the battlefield attached to Light Paws Emperor's voice, then shuffle. Yeah. First of all, love that there's a mono white commander here. We've made it. Uh, Yeah, you did it. (laughs) (laughs) This card is frustrating to play against. Tell me why. Yeah, it's um, it's frustrating, sort of first and foremost for me, from just like a time perspective of all that searching. Yeah. So much of the deck is going to be auras because that's what it do. And every single one of them creates a search. And yes, a lot of players sort of know what they're searching for for the first several. That is a problem in itself. Like the deck plays the same every time and Mm -hmm. that's boring. So... It's a lot of things sort of wrapped into one. It's the time of all the searches. It is the fact that every game against it kind of feels the same. And that's certainly not why I play Commander is to play the same game over and over again. Right. Uh, And then so many of the things that you find early are things designed to make it hard to answer. And that happens before most players are ready to deal with it. You know, it comes down on two. The thing that gives it protection comes down on three. People are still building up their mana bases at that point. So... It just becomes a situation where it's come out too fast or you do deal with it. And then that player is like, well, okay. Yeah, it's a it's an all or nothing deck where it you're either dead to light pause a turn like two or three turns earlier than you were prepared to be dead or you have remove your commander, their commander one too many times. And now they're just twiddling their thumbs with 100 auras in their hand. And that's not the kind of game you want to play either. And it, so it creates the situation where you're like, either I die or prevent you from playing, which is not exactly the, like why I'm here. Yeah. And, and even if the light pause player succeeds in taking out one player, let's say then someone else eliminates light pause and suddenly that player is reset. The player who got killed by light pause first is now just out of the game, depending on the situation where you're playing, maybe just sitting and waiting. Well, this game now goes on for who knows how long because Mm -hmm. Lightpaws got reset. Who knows if the other players are in a position to end the game anytime soon? Yeah, I I think with the... We've gotten a lot of really interesting aura commanders that I'm hoping sort of spread out the the amount of Lightpaws decks because there was a lot when Lightpaws first came out. People were really excited. I mean, it's like... It's a nine-tailed fox, which is super cool. Just design-wise, it's an aura commander that's very powerful. So a lot of people were like, at last, an aura commander. But now I think we have a lot more options and there's a lot more creativity in that space that... Hopefully we'll see a little bit less of light pause, but it does have that Voltron issue where it's just like, well, you're either dead or I lose. So I have to, you have to just kill, kill a player early. Yeah. I, I like this one. This is super interesting and it's not necessarily something that if you have a light pause deck, you think about because it's a, it's very powerful. (laughs) Yeah. You build it because it's cool and fun and you have auras you like, and you know, I don't think it's inherently, oh, wow, what a super powerful commander, or at least not one that has to be built that way. Right. But no matter how you build it, it is very likely to be Voltron-y in some way, Mm -hmm. and you just can't get around the sheer time of tutoring. Yes, that's different um, if you're playing it online, Yeah. but if you're playing it in paper, that's just so much time for every single one of your turns. You could play three auras in a turn, and each one is a tutor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I like this pick. Great one to to kick us off. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. 
Bye. Bye. All right. Up next, we have Mitch. Hi, everyone. My name is Mitch. I am the IT guy here, and this is actually my first time on the show. Yeah. We're excited to have you. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be here. Especially for such a such a controversial topic. We're talking about commanders that we don't like playing against. And you brought a classic. Make sure we cover all our bases. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, I brought Turgrid, God of Fright. Mm. It's a legendary creature god with menace. It says, whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, you may put that card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And it's a 4-5. Yeah, tiny yet that betrays. I, I played against this card a lot. It was super popular in my game store, so so we got we got used to it. Yeah, it's a pretty brutal commander to play against because any effects that make you sacrifice things or discard cards always feel bad when you're doing it to everyone at the table mm. because people can't play the game of Magic, and that's what you all came together to do. I actually love everything about this uh, mechanic because I'm one of those degenerate players that <laughs> likes to make people discard <laughs> cards and destroy lands and do yeah. all of those things, but... Uh, I don't like this commander specifically because it's just so overpowered with doing that kind of mechanic. Right. It turns any discard spell into a, a steel spell as well. So it, it doubles the feel bads of cards that already sort of tend to make people salty. Where you're like, oh, you didn't like discarding cards? How about if you discard and I steal it? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it does it does create these situations where you're like, well, I can't do anything. I can't crack my fetch. I can't like I I can't discard spells. I just need to cast as much as I can and uh hope hope that I kill this triggered player before they kill me. The interesting thing about Turgrid is it's like it was very popular when it came out because mm -hmm. it looks Awesome. Oh my gosh, yeah. It looks so good. And I mean, and it plays that way too in a yeah. lot of ways. I mean, one of the biggest arguments for it that I've heard for players that really love to play them is that it's it's 5 CMC. Uh, but these days, 5 CMC in Commander is very little and very yeah. easy to get to. Especially with Jeweled Lotus and Dark Rituals running around in black, it's pretty easy to get Turgrid out early. I mean... Like I, I played against the kind of Turgrid deck where they're like, yeah, but it's not, it's not like that. It's yeah. fine. You know? And then they've got a jeweled Lotus Turgrid pox and and you're like, okay, so we scoop. Like, I don't know what you <laughs> intended to happen. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> We're not going to continue to play now. Now the game's over. You mm -hmm. won. Congratulations. We can move to the next, next game. deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, one of the guys at our game store, he was like, I have two decks. I have Sliver Overlord and I have Turgrid. Mm. And I was like, Slivers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> not a great choice. <laughs> but yeah it's it's definitely the kind of card where you're like look i will i will suffer this deck one time mm -hmm. and if it's the nightmare that i imagine it is i will suffer it no more <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> well cool thanks for bringing in turgrid i appreciate it much. no problem thanks for having me yeah all right, up next, we've got Eric Lem. You work on the podcast. I do. You're probably editing this right now. I, I am, unfortunately. Hi, me. And hi, audience. My name's Eric Lem. I'm a podcast editor. <laughs> Thanks for joining us to talk about commander that you do not like playing against. You brought a classic and one of the most popular commanders of all time. I did. Uh, she's actually really cool, but yeah. she's uh, kind of abysmal to play against. Uh, it is Yuriko the Tiger's Shadow. One blue black for a 1-3 human ninja. She has a, an ability called... Commander Ninjutsu for blue and a black. Uh, it reads, return an unblocked attacker you control to hand. Put this card onto the battlefield from your hand or the command zone tapped and attacking. She also reads, whenever a ninja you control deals damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's mana value. This is a, an incredibly powerful commander. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's also incredibly difficult to interact with. Yes. You almost cannot meaningfully interact with this commander. The deck plays a swath of one mana evasive bodies. So they will always have a turn one evasive body, always into a turn two Yuriko, mm -hmm. drawing a card, hitting the table. Could be one, could be, I don't know, nine? They, often. Yeah. Because they have brainstorms and, and Sensei's Divining Tops and all that. Yeah. Yeah, and what really pulls the deck over is it plays a bunch of extra turn spells. So once they're set up, they have a bunch of ninjas, they have a bunch of evasive bodies, top deck manipulators. Mm -hmm. They'll just keep taking those turns until yep. they kill the table. All of those expensive spells that they're revealing and draining you. 
Yeah, Yuriko is a real snowball deck where yeah. you have to you have to remove their one mana creature. Like you have you have yeah. it just it feels bad, but mm-hmm. you have to do it or yours their engine is already online on turn two. Yes, it's also an example of a commander. They there's been two in existence that reliably cheats commander tax. It's Derevi and Yuriko. Can I? Th- I can't think of another one right now. I think that's correct. And they're both activated abilities that put the commander from the command zone onto the battlefield and ignore the the fact that often you have to pay a commander tax. Yeah. So even if you remove Yuriko, you didn't. Yeah, it's whatever. They'll just do it again for two mana. <laughs> I all of the times I've played against Yuriko, it is always a situation of it's the entire table versus the Yuriko. Mm-hmm. Cause if you don't kill her, she will kill you. Yeah. And, and it, the nice thing about playing against Yuriko is it does get the whole table on the same side. <laughs> that is kind of nice. I guess if you, if you think about it. Yeah. Where there's no politics. You're just like, I guess we're all playing kill the Yuriko player. Yeah. And then we're playing commander. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you're playing a three player game of commander. Everybody's favorite. Perfect. Yay. <laughs> At starting at 20 life total. It's yeah. Like Brawl-ish. We like Brawl. Yeah, Brawl's like fun. Brawl? It is fun. Historic Brawl on uh, Magic the Gathering Arena. <laughs> it's fun. Do you have a, a friend with a Yuriko deck? I, I've had multiple friends with Yuriko decks over mm-hmm. the course of time. Uh, they've all taken them apart. Yeah. I don't remember why. It's, I think it, it got boring, be- actually. Yeah. I think it genuinely... I think they were like, it's, it's too much of the same thing, and it's a bit too powerful. I... I think Yuriko is the, the kind of deck that when you play it, you're like, whoa, sweet. And then mm-hmm. you play it again, you're like, whoa, sweet. And it gets a little less whoa, sweet every game. But also when you're building it, it's like your Yuriko deck looks the same as everybody's Yuriko yeah. deck. It, yeah. It's very hard to build a Yuriko deck that feels special. Yeah. In my opinion, because a deck is special because of the cards that I get to put into yeah, it. Yeah, I, I completely agree though. There's, there's less variance in a Yuriko deck than there is... Um, I don't know, another deck. In various other yeah. decks. And I feel bad for Tribal Ninja players too, because I used to have a, a, a blue-black modern ninja deck. It wasn't good at all. Mm-hmm. But when they revealed Yuriko, I was like, oh, sick, maybe I get to finally play this. Yeah. Um, and then I watched a bunch of people build it and play it, and I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. And so I, I just decided not to. But most of the people who build Yuriko are like, I just like ninjas. And I feel bad because yeah. I... Like, Yuriko is such a sick card, and it's really cool, and I don't want to tell people to not play Yuriko, but it's a commander that has a power that, like, warrants, like, I'm sorry, man, I, I just got to hit you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you're not taking any damage, and we're taking a lot, so yeah. you're going to get hit a few times, mm-hmm. and you're going to have to be patient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks for bringing Yuriko, I appreciate it. I agree, that one is, a, it, she's a very tricky commander to play against. Very much so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me. Of course. It's great to be here. All right, next up, we've got Gabriel Pozos. Introduce yourself, say hello. I'm Gabriel, I'm the executive assistant to Josh Lee Kwai, and today I want to be talking about a commander that I hate playing against, uh, (laughs) is Mishra, but it might not be the Mishra you're thinking of. What I'm talking about is Mishra Artificer Prodigy. Now, uh, Mishra is a 4-4 legendary creature. Whenever you play an artifact spell, you may search your graveyard, hand, and or library for a card with the same name as that spell and put it into play. Uh, If you search your library this way, shuffle it. Um, You may be wondering what's so bad about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is Grix's Mishra. This is the the old Mishra that, like, doesn't see a lot of playing commander because we are a singleton format. Yeah, right? when I, when my friend in my play group first built this, I was curious too. I'm like, okay, sounds interesting. I don't know how you're doing this, but it sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I found out how you build this. And basically for this deck to work and the, the way my friend built it, uh, you need to have Possibility Storm out on the field. Now, Possibility <laughs> Storm 1 is probably the number one card I personally hate the most. <laughs> possibility Storm is a nightmare. It's, yes, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that why, but the way it works with Mishra is, well, let's say you have Possibility Storm out on the field. The interaction is, uh, if you're the Mishra player, you go to cast a spell, and the way he built it is with a lot of zero and one drops, and just to keep it cheap, you cast, say, an artifact spell for like zero one. And because of the Possibility Storm trigger, you get to put that card on the bottom of your library. 
Yeah, for those who haven't played against, who haven't had the pleasure of playing against Possibility Storm, let's read this. Uh, it's a five mana red enchantment. It says, whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand, that player exiles it, then exiles cards from the top of his or her library until he or she exiles a card that shares a card type with it. That player may cast the card without paying its mana cost. Then they put all the cards exiled with Possibility Storm on the bottom of their library in a random order. So yeah, the way this works with Mishra is wild because yeah. <laughs> normally there's a downside to Possibility Storm where if you cast something, you just get a random something else. But with Mishra, it says when you cast something, you get a random something else and the thing that you cast initially. Exactly. It's a two for one, <laughs> um, which is, I mean, great value, no doubt. Uh, it's a great engine to have out there. But the problem is what it does for your opponents. <laughs> like Possibility Storm and cards like Possibility Storm, you know, usually are in certain archetypes like a Chaos deck. And I think those are kind of decks that I dislike playing against. Mm. It's just a play style, depending on how they're built. Like if they're Chaos for Chaos's sake, or in, in this case where you just you just need Possibility Storm to make the deck work. But Possibility Storm, I think in particular, it just, you know, you go into a game with your decks, you build, you think about all these choices with what cards you put in your deck and go in the game with a certain expectation that, you know, you're going to try to, it's a game, you're going to try to outgame your opponents. There are certain strategies you're going to play, you're going to try to outmaneuver them in some respects. But uh, with a card like Possibility Storm, that kind of takes away that aspect of the game. It mm. takes away player agency. So usually like if I have like if I have an answer in my hand to even get rid of possibility storm, it doesn't matter. Find another. It just all your opponents it's like, okay, it turns into gambling. I'll spend this amount and hope I get what I need. <laughs> While yeah, the Mishra player can just just do whatever they want. Cast your cheapest spell and hope you you get lucky. It's uh possibility storm is is a very tricky card to play against and it's it's this kind of deck is is the kind of deck where when your opponent is doing the thing that their deck is designed to do, which is what you want for your opponents. Generally, like I want my opponents to decks to perform the way they intend it to. When they this deck is doing that thing, nobody else's <laughs> deck is doing the thing. Everybody else's deck is in shambles. Exactly. So it, it creates a very weird situation where it's like, even if you do find an answer for the possibility storm, now their deck isn't doing the thing. Right. So, and you've prevented your friend from playing. So it's like this, it's a very strange push and pull. It is. And honestly, it's also against like my friend who built the deck. He actually broke it apart because he realized that without Possibility Storm on the field, the deck just wasn't working at all. It doesn't do anything. So he had to have <laughs> it out there. And it was just very glass cannony for him. Um, he also didn't have like a, a clear win con. It was very value based. By the time any of us got lucky and was able to get a removal spell out to get rid of it, he had a, like a billion artifact mana rocks just on the field and just trying to figure out a way, <laughs> some way to do something with it to win the game. Yeah. But, um, you know, it also speaks to that kind of chaos play style. I think just like decks in general just built around pure chaos with no real win con in mine um you know like there are cards like knowledge pool is similar mm -hmm. with possibility storm um and other cards like warp world and Scrambleverse, which just take a lot of maintenance and just like a lot of time to sift through uh time sifter i hate time sifter as well speaking, speaking <laughs> but at least sifting time yeah time sifter <laughs> <laughs> at least those at least time sifter is typically in a deck that can take advantage of it but right i Totally get this sentiment. I mean, I've, I've played group hug for a long time, which people have a, a very similar opinion of group hug. And I'm a firm believer that if you're going to build chaos and you're going to build group hug, that's awesome. There are things that you can build. There are sort of one time a night decks. <laughs> you put your opponents through it once <laughs> and then that deck goes away and it doesn't come out again. Uh, and they have to have, they have to be able to take advantage of the situation that they create. Right? Like if you're building group hug, you have to thrive in a situation where everyone has cards and everyone has mana. If you're building chaos, then your deck has to be designed to take advantage of that chaos. But in this case, it's it takes advantage of it in sort of an incremental value way rather than like an explosive win the game way. Absolutely. And it's not like there aren't fun chaos cards. Like I yeah. think chaos warp, it adds an, an element to it that's fun. Like, are you going to get something even worse on the field? Yeah. Uh, are you actually going to get the same thing out? That's happened once before to me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my personal favorite chaos card actually um, it's something silly, it's stupid, but I love it when I, whenever it actually enters the, f the field is Goblin Game. Ah, yeah. <laughs> just grab how many things you can get and just hope <laughs> for the best. But it, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for taking the time. I love to hear your personal story about decks that have been ravaging a playgroup. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Next up, you know him, you love him. It's Josh Lee Kwai. Yes, everyone loves me. That is well known. <laughs> 
Well, we're talking about commanders that we hate playing against. Oh, well, so, it's you know, perfect it's, for me. It's a negative energy <laughs> episode. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm here. Nobody's listed your decks, though. Oh, that's nice. So, like, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's yeah. a good day. Yeah. <laughs> but you picked a humdinger. This is, this is one that, like, I feel like a lot of people are like, yeah... Yeah, yeah. I want to be clear. I don't blame anybody for playing this card. It is a card that like I look at and I'm like, I think that would be fun. Mm-hmm. But I also know uh, the pitfalls. It's Corvald, Fae Curse King, um, that I dislike playing against. And let me read the card. It is two and Jun, so five mana total for a 4-4 four, four flying legendary dragon noble. It says whenever Corvald enters the battlefield or attacks, sacrifice another permanent. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Corvald and draw a card. That draw card is what gets us in trouble. It's ironic, I suppose, that I'm the one saying that. Yeah, I mean, it's Jund draw a card. They're not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> it's too easy for them to sacrifice things. That's the thing, is like, Cor- Corval is the kind of card that, like, as soon as it hits the battlefield, it's a problem. Like, if you don't have a counter spell for it, yeah, because sometimes three, even cards. if they have a removal spell, it doesn't matter because no. they're you're like path and they're like, cool. With that on the stack, I have all these treasure and stuff mm-hmm. that were already there. Yeah. So, yeah, a bunch of colors can't deal with it. And then also, it's just very complicated lines because you don't have all the information that you're going to have and can't have that information when you start to do your thing. So it's continuously changing the target for you. And it's not even your fault as a player, right? Because you're like, okay, I have these cards in my hand. I'm going to start by sacking a couple of things, but that's going to draw me two more cards, which will change the whole equation maybe of yeah. my sequencing and what my plan was. And now I have to pause right there and rethink what should I be doing this now instead of that? And then the order you do stuff matters a lot because your other cards that you're holding in this deck also create or cause you to sacrifice things, either create things to be sacrificed or cause you to sacrifice things. And so you also have to think like, all right, if I play this, then that, then I draw this many. But if I play that, then this, then I create this many things to draw in a second or whatever. Like it's just very complicated to figure out like, do I play it? play my payoff cards? Do I play my setup cards? What order? Then I, as I'm doing the things, I'm drawing more cards, which continuously changes the calculus. And all this just results in very long turns. Yeah. It's the, the treasures make it even more complicated because like you're sacking the treasures and you have to pick a color like before you know all of the cards you're going to have. So you're like green, I guess. So oh, this one must be red. Shoot. I should have added two green. And so you're making decisions without information. You have to know your deck really, really well. And you have to know what outs you're looking for. And you like, don't want to sack the treasures if you have land mana, but because mm-hmm. of the a land can be decided. Like if you have command tag, you're like, well, I can decide when I've drawn my cards, if I need what color I need. So mm-hmm. I should tra- sack the treasure first. But if I do that, I have to pick the color. And also, do I want to draw the cards now or after I do a thing? And it's, yeah, I, I think. And meanwhile, Corvold's also getting bigger. Yeah. Like you're drawing cards, but have to manage this plus one plus one counter thing. And that factors into the equation because yeah. you're like, okay, well, if it's going to get to this size, I'm going to swing at this person, which means my other decisions need to be aimed in this way. And then you have all the normal calculations of like, well, okay, well, what if I go to do this and it starts to get removed? So I have to like make those calculations into my sequencing. So Corvold's just a very difficult card to sequence. Um, correctly, and because Commander's casual, and I think one of the benefits of a casual format is we're pretty lenient about the way we deal with rules and takes these backsies and things like that, but it gets us into trouble with cards like Corvald because that leniency adds to the amount of time that it's going to take because we naturally want to be like, oh, yeah, it's fine, take it back, redo it. But the problem is if it got if it took you five or ten minutes to get to where you are and now you're going to redo it and take another five to ten minutes to get to a different point and then you're going to maybe potentially make another, I'm going to say mistake, but it might not even be a mistake. It's just realize something else in the middle of it um, and then go down a third path. And now we're 30 minutes into the turn, which is pretty common with Corvald. And again, I don't blame the player because... I'm complicated. Yeah, I'm an experienced player. If I, I'm i watching the Corvald deck being like, I don't even know what's right to do. Like, I can't even, you know, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. It's your deck. I don't. Luckily, I don't have to think too hard about it. But yeah, so it's 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 just the type of deck that, you know, is frustrating because you're just sitting there being like, you're doing a lot of stuff. And also you never really know because it can, it can peter out. Yeah. Because they're going to like, okay, they're going to do this. They're going to draw a bunch of cards, but they have to draw this kind of card to sort of keep going or to turn this into a win. And so sometimes it's like 30 minutes. Go. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, we can't even concede because we might yeah. not be dead. So yeah, that I don't, 
again, I don't like to throw shade at people because I think this is not clear about this card, but I don't love the design on the card and I don't think it's necessarily the designer's fault because it's not, when you look at it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be that bad. It's just, it's only when you get into the sort of the the deep end of the pool where you're actually trying to do stuff and you're like, oh, yeah, this is, this is annoying. Oh, I shouldn't have played this land because I have a fetch land now and that it'll draw me a card. But if I lose two more life, then I, uh, I'm not going to have enough for the bolus. It's it's (laughs) just... It is it is so messy, and it's definitely it's definitely the kind of card that people feel really passionately about. So you want them to like go do the thing, but then when they have this crazy turn and they pass to you, and you're like, "All right, I untap. I play a four drop on a five drop. I hate for eleven pass." Like and you're like, it, and feels, it feels like you moments. yeah, you've wasted so much of your time. I think so. the 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 message to people playing cards Corvald and cards like Corvald, we should probably. It's 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 incumbent upon the player playing that card, I think, to be more okay with playing suboptimally and making mistakes and just kind of going down the line and being like, yeah, I'm just going to do stuff in an order that kind of makes sense, but I'm not going to try and play this perfectly because mm-hmm. that it's not that I can't do it. It's just that that will lead to all of my opponents kind of getting disengaged from the game just from right. the sheer amount of time. So if you just yeah. like make moves and just, hey, listen, I wish I chose green. I wish I sacked this treasure later. I wish I would have thought of getting the fetch land and not played my land drop. I wish, I wish, I wish, but I'm not going to go backwards. I'm just going to keep going forwards from where I am and make the best decision, the next decision and the next decision. I think that will make the turn take a little bit less time. You probably won't win quite as many games, but you'll probably play more games overall, which might mean that your percentage win might go down, but you might win the same amount just because you get to play twice as many games. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, this is also the kind of deck that's just like, you need to goldfish. You need to know how your deck works. You need to know what you're dating that's for. Fair. You yeah. need to know what the lines are. And Corvold is fun to goldfish. Yeah. Like, I have a big green game actions deck. It's really fun to play by myself because you get to do all this stuff. And uh, I, you learn a lot about the deck when you take time to practice and get to know um, the options that you could possibly have so you don't have an audience when you're... Uh, yeah, and I don't want, I don't like to make people feel nervous like, oh, I can't play my deck because I don't know it very well. I just think if you don't know it very well, the way you need to play is like I said. Yeah, it's just to go. Yeah, it becomes make a mistakes. problem when you don't know it well, but you're trying to play it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Say, I don't know it very well, so I'm going to make mistakes. That's fine. I'm okay with mistakes and just start doing stuff. Yeah. And then your turns will go quickly. And then later, I know it well. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And I might make mistakes, but that's on me because I know the deck well. Yeah. And so in either scenario, I think as long as you just flip the switch in your head that says, I'm okay with making some mistakes. And again, it's a casual format. And it doesn't really matter that much if I win or lose. And probably suboptimal Corvald will still win a million games. So, so well, yeah, <laughs> the card's really good. <laughs> yeah, trust me. If you're like, I wish I uh, sacked those two treasure for this color rather than that. In a lot of games, that won't be the difference between victory or defeat for you because it's, you're playing Corvald. Yeah, you got strong. thirty cards. Yeah, yeah you're doing it. Okay? <laughs> you're gonna be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time, Josh. Yeah. All right, we've heard from a number of members of our team here at the Command Zone talking about commanders that they don't enjoy playing against. Heavy dislike. We are a play group here at the Command Zone. We play against each other's decks uh, a lot, and that means that sometimes we find decks that we don't enjoy playing against in the office. We're going to get (laughs) to that after a few words from our sponsors. Mint Mobile presents the tale of Garrick, the cursed huntsman. Garrick was once a noble collar of beasts until his will was twisted by big wireless contracts. Ah, another bill full of overcharges and surprise fees? That makes me so mad I could just kill my former allies. Oh, hi, Garrick. Ah. So Garrick wandered the plains, too strapped for cash to call his beasts, until a simple squirrel showed him a podcast ad for Mint Mobile. What? Only 15 bucks a month for unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network. Plus, I can keep my phone and all my contacts. (laughs) With Mint Mobile, I shall axe my accursed big wireless contract and be free to call the beast once more. Hello? Is this beasts? Yeah, I got a new plan that a squirrel showed me. Hold on, let me put you on wild speaker. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash command. That's mintmobile.com slash command. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash command. What's up, Josh? Rachel, oh, thank God. I need your help. I think I'm stuck in a time loop. What? 
Oh, hiring is a nightmare. Every day I wake up and I spend hours browsing job sites and searching through resumes, but it's all the same. I'm getting nowhere. That's not a time loop, Josh. That's just you not using Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple sites, Indeed lets you attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You'll find top talent fast with powerful tools like Instant Match. Whoa, Indeed's hiring platform is great. I literally just sponsored this job post and I already have a short list of qualified candidates. It's like Indeed did all the work for me. See? Wait, so... I'm really not in a time loop? No. Oh. Oh, God. What did you do, Josh? What did you do? Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash command zone. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash command zone. Just go to Indeed.com slash command zone and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Again, that's Indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. The Command Zone has grown a lot over the years. We started as a two-person podcast, but now we're a full-grown business. Still, we want to focus on magic, not get bogged down by e-commerce. And that's why we found the perfect business partner, Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. And whatever stage yours is at, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business. For a long time, we didn't have much merch ourselves because it's hard to manage the logistics. But Shopify helped us expand what we could offer to our fans by a lot. And they even made it easier to connect with and reward our patrons for supporting us all these years. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel, whether it's in-person point of sale or online with e-commerce. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify is the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify powers millions of entrepreneurs of all sizes across the world, and their award-winning help is there to support success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tcz, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash tcz to take your business to the next level today. Again, shopify.com slash tcz. I think it might need more card draw. Who are you talking to? Or is that just something you say? Oh, no, I'm on a call with Jimmy. We're uh, building a Chatterfang deck. Ooh, I just added Toski. That should help, right? Whoa, the card just showed up. Yeah, with Architect, you can collaborate in real time from anywhere in the world. Changes show up immediately. You don't even have to reload the page. So it's perfect for brewing with a friend. This is cool, but isn't Jimmy just upstairs? Yeah, but I'm I'm downstairs right now. I ain't coming downstairs. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. All right, we are back, and I'm really excited for this section of the podcast because a lot of the decks you hate playing against, well, you found out you hate playing against them because you play against them in your local playgroup, and that is our office playgroup. Yeah, a lot of the decks that I hate playing against the most belong to the people I love the most. (laughs) As it should be. (laughs) And we're going to hear from both the deck's owners and the people that are frustrated playing against it. Excited to get into it. Let's Let's go. Let's see it. I am here with Damon and Craig here talking about commanders that we hate playing against. Uh, introduce yourselves, lads. Hey, I'm uh, Damon. I've been here a couple times. You usually see me doing uh, the precon upgrade guides, and I'm the podcast guy. So, hello. And I'm Craig Blanchett, and I'm Mr. Infect. I do all the merch. So, all the Kickstarters and stuff that you see, if you're at a show and get some of their merch, that's me. Craig, you are probably wondering why you're here. Not really. I'm just kind of wondering what commander it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Damon, you picked a commander that you don't like playing against, and that commander belongs to Craig. Tell us about what commander you picked. Yeah, so I picked Miram, Sentinel Worm. Uh, no. um, for those back home who don't remember all of the things that Miram does, it is three, a green, a blue, and a red for a 6-6 six, six legendary creature dragon spirit. It has flying. It has ward two for some reason. And then whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control you create a token that's a copy of it and if that wasn't enough except if the token isn't legendary or the token isn't legendary if the dragon is legendary so <laughs> it gets around the legendary rule which is so good you it, can't blink the tokens though I, i'm oh, sure fair. <laughs> <laughs> but you can blink the original <laughs> yes you can <laughs> so miram is cracked yeah it's absurd and tell us why you're why you don't like playing against her generally all right so i'm gonna tell you guys a little story so this was uh probably about a year ago at this point it was one of the very first games i ever played with craig and i was like oh, oh this is so exciting i get to finally play with mr in fact he pulls out his mirror deck i'm like all right let's go 
I already know. I feel like this might be a few people's experience. Yeah. <laughs> welcome yeah. to the command zone. Hey, welcome. Play against Craig. Now you know what it's like. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm playing against. I'm playing against Craig. I'm like, all right, let's go. You know, I, I've talked about it a lot. I'm a control player at heart. I like to control the board. You know, I as a control player, you're the hero the board needs but doesn't deserve. Sure. So you know, Craig does his thing. He's ramping. He's playing his mana rocks, being a responsible player, and he's able to get out a very early mirror. I'm like, okay. Cool. Powerful, but I can handle it. I got a board wipe in hand. I was planning for this. I knew I was playing against Miram. Okay. Right. He plays the Miram. He plays a threat. He, so, of course, he has three threats. That's already a board in a box right there. True. All right. Gets to my turn. I board wipe. Problem solved. Great. Next turn, he drops Miram again. <laughs> All right. And then he drops another threat. So, again, back to three threats. It's as if the board wipe never even happened. He's just like, board wipe? I don't, I, I, that's nothing to me, I'm right? In green. I've got mana for days. He does. Yeah. yeah it's, so, all right. Comes back to me. I play a second board wipe because I was that prepared, right? <laughs> right? Again, control players carrying the team. Got all, right? all these board wipes. Yeah. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. All right. It gets back to him. He drops Miram a third time, one uh, one dragon. Again, he's back to three. He's now empty-handed, proceeds to win the game. Because <laughs> now I'm out of answers. And the other two players are just like, well, I just don't have anything. I'm just like, oh, one card generates you a big enough board where it's just like, well, I'm just getting hit by like, you know, six, six dragons every turn. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to lose. Technically not one card. It's yeah. technically one card plus another one makes three. Yeah. And then you just play any <laughs> dragon you want. And even like the busted ones that are balanced on being legendary, you just have two of them now. Right. And, and you know, he plays a ton of mana rocks, taking us to mana rock city central population him. And like, yeah, it was just, it was a crazy game and I, I've never forgotten it. <laughs> you can I remember. You can too. always tell how powerful a commander is if you can build it with just entirely clones. Yeah. yeah. And Miram, like Miram clones is a full So deck. good. It oh, is. yeah. So, so good. busted yeah. because you can make more Mirams and then you play another four mana clone and make three more Mirams. And those clones you can blink. Yeah. yeah. So now once Mirams out, you boom, 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 and now you're making, yeah, it's it gets kind of ridiculous. But that's what's <laughs> awesome about it. That's what's <laughs> awesome about it. Like yeah. people who hate Ferraris have typically never driven a Ferrari. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good so, point. So, like, Mirror's one of those one. decks where, like, once you play it, like, who doesn't want to control a bunch of dragons? And then the reason that they make legendary dragons legendary is because, my God, we can't have two of these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but in this deck, you can. And it's amazing. It's just like, I play this, and then guess what? Here comes Imareth, two Imareths, and then I'm going to blink this, and then there's going to be three Imareths. And if you start adding, like... Because it's in green. So you have the token doublers. Yeah. So, you know, you start adding in the token doublers and the ETB effects. And it's just so much fun. Like, it's so much fun. How can you not enjoy playing that deck? You've you've never, have you ever played a Miram deck? I haven't, no. Yeah. You guys are going to have to swap decks. Yeah, we are. I think we're going to have to, to play some of mine. Yeah. I'll have to play some of yours. You're going to have to play like, so a conservative fun. flying Damon, blank deck. so yeah. much fun. <laughs> I mean, I believe it. And that's the thing. Like, I love flying and I play a lot of flyers, but like, they're just outclassed by all the 6-6 six, six dragons that you have. Like, it just doesn't matter, you know? It's true. And, and it, the, the ward two is like Yeah, huge. so like, I go to try to like path your Mirum and that takes three mana. That's most of my turn. It's like- And you're I, ramping for, me to get out Mirum again. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing is like, yeah, it it does. It gets crazy. Yeah. Like, why does he have ward? He didn't need it. He didn't need it. He has enough abilities as is. I will concede this. Without ward, she may be more balanced. However, (laughs) play Miram. She's a six mana commander. How bad could it be? (laughs) A six mana on rate flyer (laughs) that doubles your dragons. It didn't need the ward. I, I will say this. It does work with janky dragons. It does. When I played back then, I had just like flopped the deck yeah. together. I have since more perfected the deck, <laughs> and it it gets so much more crazy. The the oh. the crazier dragons that you throw in, but it works amazing with like a dragon whelp. Yeah, you know, like amazing. Or the the five meter one that just like gives you a treasure. You're just yeah. like, yeah, now I get two of those. So now that oh. pays for my commander tags if you happen to remove my Miram. Yep. You know, and that's the thing. Like, even if you do the target remover on Miram, you probably ate up so much of your mana, you can't remove the other thing. And even if you could remove the other thing, you need two. You need two, two of them. <laughs> so that's three targeted removal spells to, to deal with his board. Or again, you have to board wipe like I did. And I even did it twice and it didn't matter. <laughs> the funny thing about Miram is like, 
dragon decks, like Miram's a problem and you have to answer Miram, yeah. but dragons are problems generally. Yeah, they don't they, tend to make a lot of, so like even if you do answer Miram and you're like, that's 10 mana, I don't have 10 mana, I can't recast it. Let's right. say, like right. you just sure. didn't happen to have 10 mana. Yep. <laughs> you could still just play old Nabo. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> where, you're just like, where you're like, that's also a problem. <laughs> yeah, it was legit. Every single turn, he was just slamming down another thing that I had to an answer. It. And it's just like, I, d- I don't have enough removal for this. You know, like. Can't stop the dragon value chain. Good answer. Miram's a tough one. Thanks for taking the time, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, peace. All right, Craig, your deck has been chosen, but you get a chance with a rebuttal. What deck do you hate playing against? So I hate decks that make my time kind of unvaluable sure. and make me kind of watch other people's people play and not have a game end in mind. And the one that really kind of sticks in my head there is Zada Hedron Grinder. <laughs> it's, you know, one of those decks that a lot of people have, and it's uh, it's a fun deck to play. I will definitely give it that. You know, you get to find all these triggers, but, you know, the problem comes when... People don't really know their decks, and so they say, miss a trigger, and they're like, ah, can I go back and blah, 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 or they have this huge board state, and they're like, oh, what would be the optimal play, and they're thinking about the optimal play, which I'm all about, you know, if you have, you know time on your let's, hands you know just let's please read don't waste zada time. for the people who haven't played against her because she is a menace zada hedon grinder is a goblin ally for three and a red she's a three three it says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only zada copy that spell for each other creature you control that the spell could target each copy targets a different one of those creatures right so if you haven't played against a zada deck before it's extremely skill testing because you have a lot of creatures and you're drawing a lot of cards and you have a lot of triggers goblins right. in general i think are a very complicated creature type to play yep and then when you add zada's like spell slinger thing on top of it which tends to run a lot of cards that say target creature gains haste draw a card right so you target zada with that she gains haste you draw a card and then you target all of your other things let's say you have a conservative four other things <laughs> you draw four more cards they all gain haste but now when you combine that with pump effects, which are often in this deck, like usually pump and draws, and then ETB, like impact tremor type stuff, yep. it's just the deck gets really, really hairy and complicated. Well, it, yeah, it runs into decision lock a lot of times, mm-hmm. which, you know, t- tends to add more time to things because you have so many cards in hand, you're drawing so many cards, now you have more options, and now there's an optimal play, and then you draw more cards, and then the optimal play changes. And so it just causes very long turns, which uh, for me is just something I find a, a, as a pet peeve. Yeah, I, I really get this one because it's... I, I think a lot of the commanders that we're talking about today are, are commanders that take a lot of game actions but don't necessarily further the game. Right. And Zada's really fun because you get to play a lot of game actions and you get to draw a lot of cards and you're in mono red. You don't often get to do that. Yep. But when you don't know your Zada deck super well and your information is constantly changing and you're like, ah, if I had cast the pump before the draw, I could have drawn one extra card because I would have had an extra thing from this. Right. And you're like, if you're playing Zada... You need to have goldfish enough that you know your lines and you know what you're doing because that's the it's a storm deck. It's the kind of deck that takes those super, super long turns. Right. And um, I will be honest, I have a number of decks that are kind of stormy and take a lot of actions like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just goldfish them most of the time. Like I and I don't bring them to and tables because there's so much fun to goldfish. And I appreciate yeah. put, you putting in that effort because it does it is one of those things where when you know your line of play, it's actually a very efficient deck. You know, you yeah. you see a lot of cards. You can do a lot of things and you can really do a lot of damage too. Uh but a lot of people get caught up in the decision lock of man i've never been in this situation before Mm. how what's the best way to optimize this with all these options and you know to goldfish your deck like you're doing you solve that problem and you say okay when i draw this many cards if i see you know this card i'm going immediately for that so that i can figure out my next play etc yeah absolutely i think a lot of the problems with commanders like this can be solved by uh, practicing, but also making sure that your deck isn't just full of cantrips and it is yeah. full of like 
time to win now. Like well, and now that's, it burn spells, like we're moving the game now. And that's the other part is, you know, as you goldfish it, you start to change it as you are, you know, recommending. Because a lot of people, the, the, the whole dream of this deck is you have all these cantrips, right? Mm-hmm. That's the whole build of the deck is... Like you said, this creature gets haste plus draw a card. And now you're targeting five different creatures. So you're drawing five cards and then you have another cantrip in there. So you do that and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, very fun, but inefficient unless you have pump spells. Yep. Yeah. Well, you've got Imodane the Pyro Hammer now, Zada player. So hopefully you got some ways to close out the game. That's true. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time, Greg. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Thanks for having me. Next up, I am here with Jake and Jordan. Say hi, guys. Howdy. Hello. That's Jordan Pridgen. He's a writer. This is Jake Boss. You've met him. Wow. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> you, you do a like lot I, of stuff. You have a long description. Yeah. My Google calendar is wacky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jake, you've got a commander that you hate playing against, and it belongs to Mr. Jordan Pridgen. <laughs> Listen, I wanted to build this commander so bad. Let me start off by reading it. It's yeah. Obnixilus, Captive Kingpin. It's two of black and a red for a legendary creature, hum- or a demon. It's a 4-3 with flying and trample. It says, whenever one or more opponents each lose exactly one life, put a 1-1 counter on on Obnixilis and exile the top card of your library until your next 10 step you may play that card I saw this card and I was like oh, this is super cool I've got to build this um, funny and- so did I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then I played against yours. <laughs> uh, it does a lot it does yeah. a lot in uh, like I think I described it as like the teeth of the gears are so fine in this machine that he'll say and do a million things and nothing will happen. (laughs) (laughs) Which I have to admit is sort of what I love doing in Commander sometimes. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Like there are episodes of Extra Turns where we played against each other and you can kind of see Jordan's play style and like we're friends, you know, this is a safe space for each other, right? Sure. I have permission to say what I want to you. Yeah, yeah. T- tear into me. Let's do it. <laughs> Jordan's decks are so, hmm, and then I'll do this and that and that's and, and the amount of letters on the cards on his board <laughs> by the end of his freaking turn without winning the game is obscene. <laughs> I-, I would love to see. I know they did the stats episode where it's like the winner is the person with the, often with the most lands and stuff. I want to know word count on cards on the battlefield and how that affects it. Look, I don't know. Jake's got a five color transformer deck. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair though, yeah. the roughest thing about Obnixilis is yeah. like, I stand by the letter and word count mm-hmm. on your board. Okay, at the end of an Obnixil's turn, you'll have all these cards and you'll go, hmm, what am I to do? Hmm, I guess I'll just pass, scoop up all this crap and throw it in the trash. (laughs) (laughs) For those who haven't played against Obnixil's before, the way the deck works is it does a lot of increments of of one damage to players and it gives you a lot of impulse drop, but you only have one turn to use those. So it's a lot of like little gatekeeping where it's like, oh, you fetched, that means I get a a card. Oh, I hit you with a flyer, a card and everybody takes one for tapping their lands i get a card and then at then you only have so much mana to cast the things that you have so you're like okay honestly uh, yeah. i've found the deck to be a good exercise in having to accept loss <laughs> <laughs> because you don't get the two card combo what, what is it all will be one is the two card combo no, in this i don't deck? i don't run any combos in it yeah um, I, I decided... Do you run any win cons? <laughs> well, uh, my win con is hitting you with a giant Obnixilis, or eventually 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 40. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're the lucky one to get smacked with an Obnixilis to death, yeah. then good for you. Otherwise, you're getting nickel and dime to death. I think, I think a lot of people look at Obnixilis and think the trample is egregious, and uh, some people look at the trample as a mercy. <laughs> Just end it. <laughs> You know, it's funny because my my take on the commander is that I sort of wish he didn't have the trample because it makes him such a threat that he pretty much immediately gets removed. And what I wanted is just uh, just do little pings, just do a little like bow, bow, bow on your upkeep. You lose a life. You lose a life. <laughs> I think the problem with You're Jordan the worst for me Oprah as a player, ever. <laughs> the problem with Jordan for me as a player yep. is he loves playing magic. <laughs> Jordan Hate doesn't it. love winning magic. <laughs> and if he wins, then the fun is over. <laughs> 
So we we've heard why why you just like it. Tell us tell us why Optics list is sweet. I think the thing that I really like about the deck and kind of the way I built it is is I like how many cards that are basically not viable it like makes kind of interesting. Like my favorite card to play in the deck is Copper Tablet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is just a two mana artifact that says at each player's upkeep, they lose one life, <laughs> including me. <laughs> and every time I play it, people go Copper Tablet. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. That's the fun thing about Abnexilis is you keep revealing all of these cards and you're like, what are these cards? Yeah. <laughs> it is fun. It is nifty. And yeah. I, I run a Prosper deck. I love the impulsive yeah. draw strategy and all the fun tools that you get with it, like Wild Magic Sorcerer, mm. which oh, gives you a uh, cascade for the things you play from impulse draw. I think the strategy is really cool, but I like instantly did not want to build this deck <laughs> after seeing how minimally <laughs> like you do a small amount of damage and in turn you get the smallest amount of advantage. Well, you are, you also really need to be like the trigger police when you're yeah. playing this deck. Like if it goes to someone's turn, you're like, oh, it's your upkeep. So you lose life for this. Oh, also for this and for this. Oh, do you own a non-black creature? Great. You lose one for this. <laughs> Did you sack a treasure? Ah, uh, that's one damage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the funny thing is I played against this Obnixilis deck too, and it, the first time I played against it, I was like, "Ob's terrifying," and the second time I played against it, I was like, "Somebody's gonna remove it like right now. It is not." <laughs> <laughs> like it just doesn't stay on the board. It just it, no, it, like not for more than a rotation. Like I've seen you draw a lot of cards with it. My major experience but, with it is that it'll it'll exile like yeah, I exile fourteen cards. Yeah, that's a little bit like drawing fourteen cards but what it's actually a little more like is i get to choose between those cards and cast two of them <laughs> <laughs> and then someone goes we gotta kill up next so let's <laughs> you just drew 14 cards you're like i looked at the top 14 and i drew two of them and i exiled 12 <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair like we're all buddies here yeah like of course. we play against each other like at least two or three times a week oh yeah and uh this is our main play group so you know i'm not just Taking a shot across the bow yeah, yeah, yeah. One, <laughs> for a one-time thing. Yeah. We, we, we know the ins and outs of these decks after yeah. a little while. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time, guys. I really Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Thanks for having me. Actually, you stay right there. Wait, yeah. what? Yeah, you got another one. Oh, boy. All right. We are here with Jordan once again, and this time with Josh Murphy. Hello. It's me, Murph. I'm here to uh, talk about... Uh, commander slash deck that I don't particularly like. Yeah. And I'm still here. <laughs> and it Hi, belongs Jordan. to Jordan <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm really learning something about how the <laughs> office views my decks today. <laughs> All right, Merv, tell, tell us what, what deck you don't like playing against. So and I, read the card before it yes. as well. So I did not mean to dogpile on Jordan, but... <laughs> dogpile. <laughs> dogpile, speaking of which, mm -hmm. the card, or commander that I don't really like playing against is Yoshimaru, Ever Faithful. Such a cute dog, but boy. Mm -hmm. whenever another legendary permanent enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on Yoshimaru. It's got partner. It's a one mana, one, one. Uh, for reference, Jordan pairs it with Rogrok. Yes, that is the zero mana legendary. Rogue, yeah, but <laughs> for, okay. for the dream of having yeah. both your commanders out on turn one, on although turn I don't seven. normally play it that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen you do it before. <laughs> tell, tell us about playing against uh, Yoshi. Yeah, so this is one of the few decks that I've thought to myself, you know what, uh, if Jordan pulls this out, I'm probably just not going to be in that pod anymore. <laughs> not because I absolutely hate Jordan. Yeah. I love playing with Jordan. He's a ton of fun. Uh, but I found that whenever Jordan plays this Yoshimaru deck is that it's very, very aggressive and it kind of has to be. So the way that Jordan has it built, uh, it has a ton of legendary permanents and a lot of very cheap legendary permanents and ways to give Yoshimaru evasion. So as long as Yoshimaru comes down early, you have a few legendary permanents to play. You can get Yoshimaru to like six or seven power uh, over the next few turns up until like turn three. And even if you have a blocker that can soak up some of that damage early, it does not take a lot to be like killed by Yoshimaru by turn four. And you have done that multiple times to me, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is there is an adage in the office that Murph just 
is always the first one knocked out. Yeah. Like, pretty <laughs> consistently. Pretty there, consistently. There, <laughs> there was a specific time, and this was when we were we were developing the commander clock yes. for um, Game Nights Live. So this wasn't in any of our content. We were just Yeah, we were practicing Game Nights game. Live in general to see if we could make that work. And I was playing my Yoshimaru deck, and I managed to... It used to have a combo in it, uh-huh. which it doesn't have anymore. I, I took it out just because it... I don't know. I there were plenty of legendaries. It was that a didn't Cloudstone Curio combo Cloudstone for all those Curio, curious. <laughs> plus, you know, Rograk who's already there. Plus, uh, Kobolds of Care Keep, mm-hmm. and then I can just bounce the two of them and make Yoshimaru infinitely big, mm-hmm. make him a big boy. And I pulled that off just naturally in hand <laughs> on turn three, <laughs> and was like, whatever. These are supposed to be quick games. Bye, Mer. <laughs> <laughs> so I died on turn three on that one, and then just to combat damage, just to combat so damage. Brutal. <laughs> and I was playing like what was it Dak on Blackblade? <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any early creatures. <laughs> I was trying to run late, uh, but and yeah. then uh, later time you played against me with that deck, and I had like early blockers. I had two early blockers, but you still were able to kill me on turn four, I believe it was on that one. Um, and so after that game, I thought, you know what? Uh, it, it's just a little bit frustrating to me to sit down, shuffle up, mulligan, get opening hands, only to die on turn three, four, five, or whatever it is. Uh, I, I'd rather play games that go a little bit longer than that. I'd rather, you know. It's funny. In my <laughs> memory, those games did go a little bit longer. They did. <laughs> they did. I just wasn't in them. <laughs> so it's it's the same kind of frustration that I know a lot of people feel with Infect decks is that an Infect deck will usually latch onto one person and try to knock them out quick and early. So it is that similar type of frustration that I feel with Yoshimaru, which is why eh, I'd rather not play against it if I have the choice. It's definitely the problem with Voltron decks is yes. because they really can't take out more than one player at a time. So you have to remove a player as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. And Voltron itself is naturally a very casual strategy. So it 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 has this weird it lives in this weird space where like you have to knock out a player early in order to win the game. Yep. But in casual, that's sort of against the the code mm-hmm. overall. It's like you want everybody to play as long as possible and then somebody wins the game. So it's this very difficult balance. Definitely. And uh, I, I played against Yoshimaru as well. And it was a very bizarre game, actually, of Yoshi. Oh, it yeah. was on extra turns. Oh, yes. And uh, nobody had removal for this dog. I know, which, well. Nobody removed it and, and at any point. To be fair, at one point, I got it to the point where I was making it indestructible every turn right, with Gideon yeah, yeah. and a couple it other was, things like that. It was a very interesting game because it, it like, the what Voltron does to a game, especially, like, a th- the game turned into a three-player game because mm-hmm. Arthur was removed fairly early. Which which was part of my strategy course, going in yep. was, like, find someone to remove so that yep. it's a two-on-one instead of... Yeah, and it becomes this really weird game where Jamie and I were both just like, not it, not it. <laughs> <laughs> you hit him. <laughs> because we just couldn't answer the dog. Yep. Uh, and... Um, it's very funny. It is an interesting and very specific play pattern to play against. Tell us why you love Yoshi. I, I other than he's a very cute little boy. He is I, a very cute little boy. I, I, I cannot deny that. <laughs> oh, he's one cute, cute boy. Mm. Um, Doug I Rogrock love ride the Yoshi. Uh, I kind of imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Into battle. I, I basically for me. I really love just having a super, super low curve deck. And the thing is, a lot of the individual cards are not like crazy powerful on their own, but just the ability to like chain together on turn two, you know, dropping a legendary land and then playing two one drops and suddenly having your commander that you played the turn before, you know, be a five, five, because you also played a zero mana commander and that kind of thing. Um, I just think playing that quickly and that aggressively and how fast he plays and, and how smooth the deck feels as it goes on just because the curve is so low and it's mm-hmm. always like bop, 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 bop. It just feels really fun to play. And like, as soon as I saw Yoshimaru spoiled, my very first thought was that I wanted Rograk and I wanted to just like have, you know, a low curve, everything legendary. And I've gotten it to the point where like well over half the cards in the deck are legendary. And this is including the lands Mm -hmm. and stuff. Like there's literally over 50 legendary cards in the deck. And uh, it it just, it, it feels really great at this point. Like, yes, it does take someone out fast, but it's very efficient at getting to that plan. And I don't know. I really enjoy it. The problem is, Jordan, it feels great for you. It does not feel great for me. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but how bad could it be? Because the games are sort of short. 
are pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I I think we all kind of have have like an end of the night deck where yeah. where you're like I bring this out when I when we're trying to speed up a game yep. when we're trying to like like we're here like I have a, the blue red dragons approach deck where it's just like look Deals lots of damage. I'm not here to win this game. I am here to half life totals and then be murdered for my annoyance. Or if nobody deals with it, then you kill everybody. Then I kill and everybody. It still is pretty and, quick, right? And then it's yeah. <laughs> the, the funny thing for me with this Yoshimaru Rogue Rack mm-hmm. deck is I was convinced it was going to be a jank deck when I first started like building and I was like ah whatever it'll make a big dog he doesn't have evasion it'll be it's okay quite good though it it's is. very good yeah I, like the first two times I played it I was like oh this is much better than I expected it and it's not even a lack of interaction on the part of the table like the deck just naturally has a lot of interaction pieces lots of great ways to protect Yoshimaru mm-hmm. and so Yoshimaru just oftentimes does not get dealt with even after taking out a player. And the yeah. tough part is that you deal with him and I'm like, okay, I'll pay three mana and replay it. I know, right? And then just <laughs> play some more things. Like, it's a very resilient deck yeah, as well. Yeah. It's uh, it's cool that Yoshimaru made this list. I, I, I <laughs> like, honestly, you look at the card and you're like, it's, uh, it's next to, like, some crazy <laughs> It's next to Miram and Zada, Korvold, Turgrid, and they're like, also this dog! I mean, to be fair. But that shows... But I don't like much of those either. <laughs> yeah, right. But this is, like, a very specific play pattern that, that shows up that you're like, yes. you know what? I am... My decks are not built to fight with a deck that's quite that aggressive yeah. because they're in they're designed for a different kind of game. So that's uh, something to be prepared for when you're sitting down with, you know, in any pod where you're just like, if your deck is going to be crazy aggressive, then I'm I'm just not prepared to interact on the axis that I am to be competitive. Yeah, and it's totally fine that yeah. uh, Jordan has a deck that's this fast, but it's also totally fine for somebody to be like, eh, I, th- I think I'd rather not. I'm here to dirt. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And we are still very good friends and we like playing with each other and we like each other a lot. And that's just dynamics of a play group. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the mark of a healthy play group, I think. Yeah, thanks for taking the time, guys. We appreciate it. All right, we've talked about two of Jordan's decks. So we're going to give you an opportunity to talk about a deck that you hate playing against as well. And this one is a classic. Yes, and I would say that this deck used to be more of a like scourge of the format sort mm. of thing, and I don't see it as much anymore. But when Because everyone hates playing against it. W- when you talk about decks that really like grind my gears mm. that really I'm just like frustrated about. They, they, one, I'll say at the beginning, I don't really dislike playing against pretty much any deck but yeah this are, one i think i think that would that's a, actually a really interesting point where we're just like like a lot of people had answers for this pretty quickly mm-hmm. and you really didn't yeah because if if i'm honest i'm i'm kind of like the worst case scenario is you play one mm-hmm. uh, slightly unpleasant game against something and i'd still kind of rather the person you know play the deck they want to play and that yeah. kind of thing I totally get being upset about it, but this commander Yeah, but does, this one sucks. I, w- I would never say I wouldn't play against it, but if you play it, I'm going to remove you if I can. Yeah. Uh, and that's because the card is Narset, Enlightened Master. Yeah, classic. Uh, this is three blue, red, white for a 3-2 legendary creature, Human Monk. It has First Strike and Hexproof. Uh, and whenever Narset and Lydon Master attacks, exile the top four cards of your library until end of turn. You may cast non-creature spells from among these cards without paying their mana costs. This card's wild. This card is insane. So there's like, there. I think the first time you look at Narset, if yeah. you've never played against Narset before, you're like, she's a six mana three two with an attack trigger. How bad can it be? And then, but Narset decks are designed to have Narset on turn three yeah. and four. Everything in the deck is designed to get Narset on the battlefield as fast as possible. And I assume with a Narset deck mm-hmm. that if you attack with that Narset, you are going to win the game. Right. Because the way the decks tend to be built is mm-hmm. that at least somewhere in those four cards, even if it's just like, okay, I actually get an extra turn, so I do this sort of thing. There's something that will kind of keep the chain going. Right, extra turn, More extra spells. combat spells. Um, yeah, Nurset's traditionally, and even if they say it isn't, it's often built with any as many ways to trigger Narset, like as many times in a row. If you attack once... That's it. Yeah, and it'll have uh, multiple combat spells, mm-hmm. or it'll have extra turn spells, or something that's you know a huge expropriate style of, style effect that will just kind of end the game in mm-hmm. your favor. 
Um, and even when people have ones that are like, oh, no, this is a fun Narset deck. It's a I'm Planeswalker like, Narset deck or something like that. You're like, you're still, still casting four non-creature spells for free. It's a lot. And the thing that bothers me about it, because I don't really mind like doing some big powerful thing like that, but Narset just really shores up all of the things that could make this strategy weak. Mm -hmm. Like on the card already, she has Hexproof. Naturally. Yeah. And... In my mind, I'm like, yeah, do whatever you want. Do these crazy, powerful things. Um, but there should still be ways for your opponents to interact with it that don't involve basically like sideboarding your commander deck to like right. be sure that's out there. Like no one wants to play edicts or yeah. stuff like that in their deck. And like that's the sort of thing you have to have, you have against to have the Narset deck. Yeah, Narset's the kind of deck where if you see it in the command zone across from you, you have to like mulligan appropriately. Yes. Like you have to make sure that you have something that you can do against this deck. You need to be able to remove Greaves or Boots or anything that gives haste. You have yep. to be able to remove Narset if you can. Uh, you or you just have a board need wipe. a board wipe, yeah. yeah. And then even then, the deck is designed to get Narset on the battlefield. Well, and the worst part is, you know, even if it's like, okay, somebody had the board wipe mm -hmm. and they wipe the board, then they'll play Narset again, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit later, and you're suddenly back to that whole thing. It warps the whole game around stopping Narset yeah. from being able to attack. And also, this is just the smallest thing, but she's got first strike. So it's not even like a real risk to attack with her. <laughs> it's that, such a small little extra thing. And I'm just like, like, wow. It's like the first strike on Chain Whirler. You're like when <laughs> yeah. everybody was like, what? Why? It, it already does good. It's awful. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, Narset's interesting. I think it's a great pick because it's the kind of commander that when I look at it and I was like, this commander does, does everything for you. Mm-hmm. So the deck doesn't have to do anything. All the no. deck has to do is be like more commander. And I don't tend to like that play style where it's yeah. just like I pick one card and the whole deck is about making sure the one card is in play or I have multiple copies of the one card or like everything is about having one cool permanent. Yeah. And then the rest is just happens naturally, you know, mm -hmm. like playing against a like a like a coma deck sure. where it's just like if coma's in play, it protects itself. It protect like it's just going. The yeah. deck is just working, and it's because you have one card in play. And coma was another one I kind of considered. For yeah. This. So it and it it just makes it feel easy. Yeah. So and I tend to I tend to play decks that don't make it easy for me. So when I feel like I'm playing with a handicap and my opponent is playing with a you know formula. F1 car. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're like, I what? Yeah. I'm doing a three-legged race, like a sack race. I, I really don't mind if people like do race? something big and, and stuff. Like if, if you do have a commander that's like, oh, if this commander stays on the board, mm -hmm. it's going to be really good. And then you build in, you know, lots of things to give it hex proof at instant speed and ways to like try and stop people from killing it. Oh. And you like work to keep your commander on the board. Yeah. I respect that. Yeah. Because that's a strategy and you're building towards it. With Narset, she already does that work for you mm -hmm. and you just need to put powerful things in your deck. Yep. They have to be non-creature spells, but that is a very wide variety of options. We talked about this a little bit when you brought up Narset. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if somebody sits down at your table and you're like, it's Narset, but what is your reaction? You're like, it's, it's Narset, but it's not that Narset. Or it's Narset, but it's not extra extra turn com Narset. Uh, what, is, what is your reaction? I, I still am probably going to remove them. Yeah. Because whenever when people are like, oh, it's fun Narset, I'm like, what do you mean fun Narset? Yeah. It probably still has insane cards in it, right? Right. It you still run... is casting, like, you know, ultimatums and stuff. Yeah. It's still going to probably, I don't know, like, sneak out an omniscience and a draw seven mm -hmm. and then cast all the cards that come in to the hand and you're like yeah it's not the narset that everybody played for a while but it's still a nightmare it's still gonna be <laughs> if you attack you're gonna get so much advantage that right. there's it's unlikely that we come back from it yeah you have to treat narset like it's narset yep i i agree i mean i'm always like if somebody play if you play a, command, a powerful commander you need to be prepared to be treated like you're playing a powerful commander absolutely there's nothing that you can say in rule zero to me that will make me evaluate the power level of narset differently because the card is powerful it's like it's urza but it's not that urza it's still urza well because the floor case right for narset which is like okay you know I flipped four cards and they're just like a couple pieces of removal mm -hmm. and stuff. It's still great. Yeah. That's still really good. Yeah. It's um you you have to be prepared for 
for your deck to be the menace that it is. And sometimes it's fun to be the menace. Oh, it rules. <laughs> I like to be the menace sometimes. I have certain decks that are like, yeah, I'm going to be a problem and you need to deal with it. <laughs> and then I have some decks that are like, I'm going to sit and I'm not going to be the problem until yeah. you can't do anything about it. So if you like driving a race car, drive a race car. Just know that's what it is. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time, Jordan. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I love the, the, there's just so much history too between the players that makes play groups really fun. So it's great yeah. to see people talk back and forth about their, uh, their likes and dislikes. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Now it's time for, I think our decks that we hate to play against, right, Rachel? I was going to say, we can't leave the people hanging here. We have for decks that we are frustrated playing against as well. Yeah. Jimmy, what, what's the one that grinds your gears? I hate playing against Edgar Markov decks. And I hate <laughs> saying it because he's like the most popular vampire commander by a long shot. But it's not because of Edgar specifically. It's because of Eminence. Eminence, so we'll read Edgar. Eminence yeah. was, I think, one of the definitely one of the worst ideas for a commander in yeah, a while. they brought it back. What? I know. They're like, maybe we could make it less powerful. No. Out, it's still very powerful. Yeah. So Edgar Markov is three in Mardu, so six soul for a four, four. You're like, six mana commander. Well, here's Eminence. Whenever you cast another vampire spell, if Edgar Markov is in the command zone, or on the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one black vampire creature token. And then Edgar himself has first strike and haste. And then whenever Edgar attacks, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each vampire you control. Vampires are like one of the most printed types in they're the history so of magic. popular. And they're so powerful. There are 1 drops. There are 2 drops. There are 3 drops. There are 4 drops. There are 5 drops. There are a thousand vampires. And so what this means is that turn 1, play a swamp, play a vampire, get 2 creatures on the board. You are ahead of the rest of the board, and guess what? That train just keeps on going. And there's so many vampire lords that pump up your creature. So it's not even like Edgar's ability that, oh, wow, he attacks, he puts 1-1 one, one counters. That doesn't matter in vampire decks, because they have 15 other ways to have that happen. And then they can kill you with aristocrats, and then they can kill you with just straight combat damage. It's one of those things where you're like, wow, the game got off to a fast start, and it's not because they had a mana crypt. It's because they had Edgar in the command zone. Right. So for me, I, I don't like playing against vampire decks because you fundamentally almost instantly make them the arch enemy, and that can sometimes sway games a little bit. If your deck just isn't fit to fight against that much early aggro, you might just die, uh, and it's really hard to stop. Yeah, I agree. Edgar puts so much pressure on early that you almost have to mulligan to make sure that you have yeah. a board wipe or some kind of answer for Even being attacked. Even board wipes don't matter, though. Yeah, because, because the then they cast two creatures, and they have four bodies have four on the board bodies, Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it, it's really tough. I think Edgar's one of the more powerful. Is it, so uh, Eminence abilities. Yeah, there's the Ur Dragon, but Ur -Dragon the Ur Dragon is, is like good. whatever. There are there are other spells. It's five colors, make, which makes it more powerful. Five colors, me. and the the mana cost on that is like ten or something. Mm -hmm. And sure, there are other spells that reduce your dragons by one. You can just play a card that does that at yeah. three mana. Edgar, there's no other Eminence ability like Edgar's that just lets it pop off. Even Arabo, which you played before. Yeah, very is powerful, yeah. but nowhere near as good as Edgar. Ton of pressure, and there's not much you can do about it unless you can lock him in a oubliette or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Throw him in an oubliette or, or, I don't know, encase him in stone in the wall. Isn't that what happened to some other vampires? And here he did some stuff. I'm not sure. I'm just trying to do some lore stuff out here. I but know. I don't I like, like <laughs> Edgar. I was like, it like Han Solo. <laughs> yeah, and look, if you play Edgar, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> also, red, white, black, they have tons of ways to reanimate. Yeah. Mess with their graveyard. Even if you board wipe, they're, they're coming back. They're coming back, yeah. They're vampires, so I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Hard to keep a good vampire You know down. what? Maybe if you play another one of the worst things in Magic, the daylight, nighttime theme. Oh. That way, when it's daylight, the vampires can't come out. <gasps> That's not how it works. No. <laughs> All right. <not. laughs> All right, Rachel, what is the commander that you hate to play against? Mine is a very popular commander as well, and it has a lot to do with this commander, but also a lot to do with this archetype in general. Yeah. My pick is Sithis Harvest's Hand. I'm going to change my answer as well. I hate playing against Sithis decks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Sithis, for those who are unfamiliar, it's green and a white for a legendary enchantment creature, Nymph. She's a 1-2 and says, whenever you cast an enchantment spell, you gain one life and you draw a card. Oh, gosh. Enchantress on the commander. It's so... She's two mana. It's endless. 
and the, the turns are endless and she gains life the thing Ugh. about sith is is it's an enchantress commander that plays like a storm commander but doesn't have the storm win cons yeah it can't be like right so, great shot everyone to death no. yeah <laughs> but it's still like cast a thing draw two cards cast a thing draw three cards cast a thing draw two cards cast a three make three pegasus draw this, this. draw gain life gain life and then the best part is um okay pass turn pass okay what what has happened We've been here 25 minutes. You have a lot of things on the board. I can't target any of them. They all have Shroud and Hexproof for some reason. Very difficult to interact with. The turns are very long. The permanent, like you have to have a Bane of Progress or an Ustier Command yeah. or something to deal with it. And then you hit me with a 2-2 in the air. That was your entire turn. And you're it like, took 15 minutes. You're like, great, cool, thank you. <laughs> I have been trying to build, because the people who love Enchantress love it so much, and yeah. I've been trying to find an Enchantress deck that's, like, interesting to me. Well, we do have a lot, thanks to Eldraine. Yeah, and we've Nicthia. gotten some cool new ones. Yeah. And um, Sithis continues to be to be the most popular because she's just kind of, she's clearly the most powerful, but just kind of the easiest. Yeah, and also you can put this into every Enchantress deck that runs the colors. It's just two mana, so it's not hard to recast. So killing Sithis feels so... Killing so anything bad. in Enchantress Beds feels bad because they just read... It's like your one piece of interaction was triumph trumped by their six card draw. Yeah, they have so much redundancy in decks like this. There's like nine Enchantresses at this point. Yeah. And so like, I don't know. Playing against it, they all kind of look the same is the other thing. Like I've never played against a Sithis deck that's like, oh, that's a neat include. Oh, wow. That's a hot tech. It's just like, it's yeah. just burgeoning exploration. You're like all the yeah, one mana yeah, enchantments yeah. that we play against all the time. So I I don't love playing against Sithis decks and uh, I don't know. I'm still kind of waiting to find an Enchantress deck that I'm like, this is the one for me. So I kind of like the new aura one, the one that pays to tap adds an aura, but that's an aura deck less yeah. so an Enchantress. I mean, you, you could copy like big enchantments and stuff like that's yeah. a That's a cool one. Yeah. Um, there are options out there, but to the listeners, let us know if you've built a Sithis deck that doesn't suck. No, just kidding. They're all <laughs> send, good. Send me a list. <laughs> that's the problem is that they don't suck. They're all good. They're just busted. And I get why it's fun. I get it. Yeah. But, ugh, gosh. Who do something. Love drawing cards? Uh, so let us know what commanders you hate playing against in the comments. I'm sure that there are a lot out there that we have not mentioned. Maybe some Jin Cataxiuses and stuff. Yeah. If you have evil What's people. What's in your playgroup? Always, I'm always curious to know what the scourge of a playgroup is yeah. because sometimes they're like, oh, man, they there's this Zerda, Zergo deck that's <laughs> brutal. And you're like, wow, I haven't wow, seen a Zergo, Zergo deck yeah. in years. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Or they'll say uh, like a land destruction deck or something. You're like, wow, like, those play groups definitely still exist. You're right. You're um, right. But let's know, is it about the commander that you hate or is it the archetype like Sithis? Um, when, what makes the commander frustrating to play against as well? Yeah. Happy to hear. If you heard us talk about a commander that we don't like playing against today and you're like, you know what? That commander actually sounds <laughs> That's right up my pretty, alley. <laughs> pretty sweet. Uh, Craig's Miram deck does sound oh, awesome. Man. Everyone should build a Miram deck just to feel the glory Ugh. of Miram. No. <laughs> yeah, so good. I'm a little upset about Miram, but that's another story because they will never make a better dragon commander no, no, as far it. as I'm concerned. No, it's yeah. that or the Ur dragon. They're like, there's no yeah, way. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Maybe they should give Miram eminence. That's a good idea. We, we, I think so. <laughs> yeah, just in Allah for dragons. Yeah, why not? Uh, but yeah, head on over to cardkingdom.com. <laughs> yeah. Go pick up, go pick up your Mirams at cardkingdom.com uh. slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards, so if you are looking for some hot tech for your new deck, you're sure to be able to find a lot of it in one place. Card Kingdom will get it all packaged up safely, professionally, and shipped to you in short order, so you can get your cards, and they're not crammed in an envelope and bent into your oh gosh <laughs> into your I had mailbox a couple, yeah. i've had so many cards damaged because they just get shoved into my mailbox i on know top of each it's other. really annoying so making sure that it is packaged uh, carefully and you're getting the cards in the quality that you paid for plus they have a great customer service so if anything happens to your cards in the mail you can get a hold of them and get that problem taken care of absolutely we trust card kingdom when we are picking up our decks especially for game nights live when we need a lot of cards in a hurry go over to cardkingdom.com slash command to support your growing magic addiction and also the show no it's your magic passion 
passion and to support that passion you're also going to need to make it dressed up and look nice like it's a dollhouse but it's your cards you're dressing up instead <laughs> and instead of pretty little dresses you're putting sleeves on them from <laughs> ultrapro.com slash command i want little poly pocket sleeves <laughs> yeah. now for i want like a ken suit for my commander like a little yeah that'd Bandana. be amazing all right aside from that ultrapro.com slash command does have products that you think are going to be awesome because you're like wow i didn't know that existed mm-hmm. they have cool like cases for your commanders that are like uh, magnetic snap-on cases that i've used sometimes that also just help display more cool cards of yours. Um, they've got play mats. They have uh, deck boxes, dice, you name it. They also have amazing sales from time to time. They have stuff for sports cards. They have stuff for Pokemon. They have stuff for all sorts of different things. So check it out at ultrapro.com slash command. They have a great uh, selection of stuff there, as well as just buying Ultra Pro product from your LGS is another way to support the show. And don't forget, we have a Kickstarter running right now. It is the Go to Combat Playmat Kickstarter. You can get a sweet Playmat in regular or in hollow foil. Oh, yeah. So if, cool. If you want to be blingy, you can pick up our metal tokens. There's the Jimmy Food token, Hug and a Cheese Steak. And yep. <laughs> there's the Josh Monarch token as well at higher levels. Go over to the Kickstarter. Make sure that if you are interested, you order right now because it is not going to be available for long. Yep. Yeah. Kickstarters are limited time so get your pledge in and once you pledge you can also check out the add-ons that are available for those tokens or you can just have more play mats the hall foil looks amazing if that is your style but make sure you check it out the art is beautiful we love making these play mats because we just love bringing aspects of commander to life with just amazing art by great artists so again the link is gonna be in the description below do not miss your chance to get it it's gonna be your best chance to get it on this kickstarter limited time go 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 lock in that pledge today thanks everybody <laughs> All, All right. right, we've we've talked about a lot of things in the magic world today. Yeah, do you want to talk about something else? Oh, on the end set, where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. <laughs> yeah, uh, what have you been up to lately? Jeez, Louise, what have I been up to? I know uh, I we're moving right now, so I uh, that, that's all I, I've been doing. Yeah, what is your favorite part about moving? Because everyone knows the least favorite parts about moving. The moving part? Yeah, is there anything that's like wow, uh, that's so cool? So I've been. I, this is this is a weird end step, but I've been really into Craigslist right now. Okay, and that's because like I was using Zillow and I was looking for apartments and stuff yeah, on yeah. Zillow, and everything felt like a weird trap. <laughs> but the like, Craigslist wasn't. I that's the thing is I went to Craigslist and it was full of places that were like like look I'm a lady I've got a house can you please just rent it for oh, me? Oh wow! So it okay. felt like a lot more like smaller things where Zillow was all like we have 900 units you're free to yeah, yeah 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 to tour all of them we won't know your name and we have no idea when we'll get your fridge fix (laughs) (laughs) and so i like i we found a really great place on craigslist and now i'm using it to look for like furniture and stuff and it's really fun that's interesting craigslist if you look at the history of it it's like one of the most interesting businesses ever because the website is identical to what it looked like 5, 10, 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, their or logo is a peace sign. Yeah. What? And they haven't changed it, nor do they like stuff it with ads or whatever. You go on platforms like Twitter now, and I just get all these bizarre ads for things and yeah. Instagram and every social media. It's Craigslist has just remained pure to what it's all about. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of really weird, sketchy things that happen on Craigslist, yes. and every city is going to be different as well. We're in LA, so obviously it's a very, it's a much bigger birth of stuff that you can find there. Mm. But it's true. It, you will find just real people as opposed to yeah. corporate. We bought 500 units and we're trying to sell them now. I was like, every time, every place we were going to on Zillow, I was like, I feel like you're lying to me about the price. I yeah, feel like you're yeah. lying to me about how, like, how well this place is maintained. Like, this is a mess. I can see it's a mess. Yeah. Every it's photo. Probably- water damage yeah. yeah every photo looked like super color corrected and then i went on greg's list and there was just like a guy taking terrible place pictures of <laughs> like of a house and we're like i bet this looks better than these pictures. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, and fun. uh it, it really worked out for us in la and um you know looking for apartments out here is a true nightmare yeah so i don't know i yeah, guess this end steps about craigslist <laughs> I, I like that i like that a lot look up the history of craigslist i think yeah. it's really interesting and fascinating because it is much more community run than a yeah. lot of these bigger things and as a result you know obviously use your discernment but you can definitely find some hidden gems on there yeah i also found that like facebook marketplace because oh man i love the marketplace it's a great it's the only reason i use facebook anymore yeah 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 and sometimes a college friend will message me on facebook messages and i'm like why <laughs> but okay <laughs> all right that's our end step uh let us know if you have a fun experience <laughs> with craigslist i guess i i you know there is another craigslist that i do love and it's craigslist of cards that i've traded with them downstairs hey 
<laughs> Speaking of, let's give a big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. That is Damon Lenz, Arthur Meadowcraft, Lady Danger. Oh, Lady Danger, actually. We're going to throw it out to you. She's no longer here. Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, who I just talked about. Josh Murphy, Jake Bostro, and Pridgen, Sam Walder, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Mitch Trafford, Evan Limberger, Gabriel Posos, Megan Yip, Eric Lem, and Josh Lee Kwai. And Katie. Can't forget Katie Cole. Yeah, of course. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed seeing our staff members out here duke it out and talk about the decks they hate. <laughs> See you next See time. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com. Or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>